place that uh, made nerd cool. The most popular password in the United States is password one, two, three. Those are some of my previous passwords. Who on earth would actually fall for that? Sensitive information has been given to the wrong hands. The security repo. Welcome back to another episode of the security repo. I'm here with Lynn No, who is, well, amongst other things, a, a hacker, a human cyborg, a transhuman, other, there's other acronyms I can call you, but Lynn, welcome. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, really a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, man. Thank you for having me. So to, to, to start off, maybe you can give a little bit of a, of a brief rundown about uh, a little information about you, what you've been working on, and uh, you know some of the things that make you uh, uniquely you. <laughs> okay, I think we only have an hour for this, so I'll try and keep it short. <laughs> Uh, at a high level, uh, yeah, my name is Len No. Uh, I am a technical evangelist, biohacker, and a white hat for CyberArk software. Uh, I've been currently in the IT field for going on 30 years. Uh, I, I specialize in the attacker's mindset. I'm also probably most well known for being one of the thought leaders around the transhuman community. I currently have close, I have eight current microchips that have been implanted inside my body that I use for the purposes of offensive security. And I'm working on actually getting a fully integrated copy of Linux implanted into my leg. So that's, that's the next big one. That's, that's, that's quite in, incredible. So let, let's talk, talk about, talk to me about that, that transhuman movement. This is probably something that people aren't aware of, particularly in the, maybe in the, the cyber field. You know, is this a, a, a movement that's happening? Is this something that defenders should be concerned about, worried about, focused about, you know, and, and, and what is kind of the transhuman movement? Absolutely. Okay, the term transhuman was actually coined by a gentleman in the UK named Julian Huxley way back. Uh, and essentially at a high level, the transhuman movement is a group of individuals who want to move the human body and the capabilities of the human body beyond what they were born into. Uh, personally, I am, uh, a subset of the transhuman community because I'm actually also, like I said, a white hat. So the question you asked was, is this something that cybersecurity professionals need to be aware of? I absolutely, you know, when you look at someone who like myself, who has the ability as a human being to directly interface to your tech stack, that is going to open holes and vulnerabilities that you may not be aware of. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I would definitely recommend checking out the presentation that I did two years ago at RSA called Biohacker, the Invisible Threat. Uh, in that d presentation, I showed three different ways that through the use of subdermal microchips that hackers can potentially compromise both physical security as well as mobile security and IoT. And the problem with that is, especially if we're, depending on where you live, there are regulations around personal medical information. So even if you were discovered, you know, the ability for any type of authority to be able to try and compel you to be able to disclose what's going on becomes a very gray area. So if the, there's one of me, that's enough for, that, for the fact that I think IT professionals need to take this kind of thing seriously. Well, I mean, people are manufacturing these chips, so there, there must be more than more than one of you. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm definitely people probably thinking on this line. And um, okay, I, I'm going to break in right there. I'm going to break in right there because I, I'm actually where I'm coming to you today from is actually at the B sides Newcastle event, and I'm actually sitting at a table with the uh, guys from KSEC. You know, and if you're not familiar with them, they're one of the biggest implant distributors in Europe. So we sat down and actually had a conversation about this yesterday. And between Dangerous Things in the United States, which is the biggest uh, microchip distributor, and KSEC, we've actually kind of have a rough number of how many transhumans there may be out there. Because uh, I know the Amal from Dangerous Things, and we're, we got a um, pretty modest estimate that there's probably between 400 to 600,000 of us globally at this time, just between these two manufacturers. 400 to 600,000, you said? Yes. There have been wow. 400 to 600,000 implants sold. Now, does that mean that they actually made their way into a person? I don't know. But those are the numbers as far as the sales. So that's why we said we're giving it a kind of a large, you know, 
uh, plus or minus value there. But yeah, it could potentially be between 400 to 600,000 transhumans walking the globe at this time. That's crazy. That's crazy. And just before I forget, I do want to reiterate that that talk at RSA was was fantastic. I, rem I remember that Thank talk. I, I made a I made a video on that talk. Um, so yeah, I, I remember everyone. <laughs> That's it. Don't want to sound like too much of a fanboy here, but um. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you what, you, you're back just a kudos to you. Cause I remember when I saw, you know, the video that you put up and your, your opening made me laugh for at least five minutes, you know, and if you haven't seen, let's saw that, that go check it out. It was just funny. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. I was a bit worried about like, you know, putting that in as like, is this going to be too, too edgy, but we'll, we'll, uh, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. Uh, but let, let's talk about some of the, the capabilities of these implants. 400 to 600,000 sure. thousand sold. Okay, so this is a significant threat, right? This is a just... Mm -hmm. um, a significant a, potential. Potential, threat. yeah. Right, because, I mean, these aren't always designed for malicious purposes. I'm sure there's lots of legitimate use cases for these implants Absolutely. going in, going in, I don't want to skip over that. But let's talk about some of the nefarious use cases. What what are some of sure. the things that you can do as a result of these implants that you know a normal uh, a normal human kind of wouldn't be able to do? A normal black hat. Okay. Well, a lot. The big issues when it comes to the implant is the obfuscation possibilities. You know, one of my favorite attacks that I did personally was the compromising of physical security. Based on the implant, you know, we have MyFair Classics, Pyramids, Indala, HID 1, 2, and 3, Prox. So if you have a uh, something like a Prox market, you know, the ability to scrape a, a, an ID card has been around for almost two decades. And the difference between what I'm doing and the breaches in the past is the fact that it's written down to the subdermal implant, even if you catch me, and, and this is the, the big difference, even if you're able to catch me, all I have to do is say, you know, hey, the door was open. You know, I didn't realize this was a server room. I just thought it was a bunch of computers. I thought it was cool. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, when you look at it from a legal perspective, you know, the worst thing that you're going to be able to do to me is trespass me. Yeah. And if you take the fact that I've already been in there, you know, depending on when you catch me, we have so many different things that I could do once I've actually gained access to your, your infrastructure. We have WHID cactuses, bad USBs. I could, you know, if I'm in there, there's the potential that I could move that into a larger attack. And the fact is, if I don't have, say, a cloned card or I don't have a proxmark in my hand, from a legal perspective, I, all I have to do is play dumb. You know, and mm -hmm. unless you can prove that I was there to try and do some type of nefarious act, the worst thing you're going to be able to do is have the authorities say, you know what, they don't want you back here on this property. But by that point, the damage could already be done. Right. So there's, yeah, there's, there's a total lack of evidence in your hand. I mean, I saw a demonstration of Kevin Mitnick cloning an ID card and he had a big briefcase with him. They had a, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a cloner in the briefcase, you, you know, like, okay, you could definitely do it. It was, it was a, a neat little trick, but I mean, you've got nothing. You, you've just got these implants in your hand that are able to kind of scrape information from, from that security card. Yeah. And, and absolutely. And yeah. that's the exact point. You know, if you use your example with Kevin Mitnick, you know, it's the same difference of having lock picks on you when you're caught you know, in some place that you don't, it, it's, it's tools that could be referenced as thieves tools, or, you know, there's some type of evidence as to how you got there and how you managed to be somewhere you're not supposed to be. When it comes to me, it's completely, you know, not there. And based on where you're located, there are so many privacy laws when it comes to our personal medical that I'm going to speak for the United States because that's where I'm from you know, they're not allowed to ask me, you know, because we have a law called HIPAA. So you, they cannot ask me about anything that would be considered medical. So I'm actually playing on that gray area to the point where I know even if they see like, you know, the bulge from a microchip in my hand, they're not going to be able to really go down the rabbit hole and force me to disclose what it is. Yeah, that's really interesting. And as particularly because this is such a new, uh, a new field, I mean, like, 
my brain wouldn't immediately go to, oh, he must have implants in his hand either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have this all these exactly. legal legal backups here that you can that you can lean on. But I mean, someone has to kind of make that jump in the first. Yeah, place. You, you have to make the you have to make the leap from, you know, what most people would expect where, you know, oh, he stole a badge. He, mm -hmm. you know, rode in behind somebody else. Yeah. And I'm coming at it from a completely different direction that most people aren't even thinking about. And it's my hope that through, you know, broadcasts and publications like yours that, you know, this is, this is coming. And I mean, I, I actually did a, the closing keynote here at B-Sides yesterday. And if you'd like, I'll send you a copy of the deck and everything, but it was called resistance is futile. We're already born, you know, right. and it just go, went, went into the fact that we are so dependent on technology as a species, as the human being. And we're trying to even integrate more of that technology. You know, when you look at the fact that we have, you know, now implantable stem pain receivers, pacemakers have been around forever. But what a lot of people may not be familiar with, UCLA actually is working with spinal implants that are actually restoring motility to paralyzed people. And that actually has a controller and a battery pack that gets implanted inside the body as well. You know, we're looking at, you know, things like uh, Synchron, which is... Tesla's main competitor and the brain computer interfaces, you know, these, they're already in human trials. You know, every one of these embedded systems has firmware. It has security issues. You know, these are things that are going to need to be updated as we move down the line. And nobody's talking about these kinds of vulnerabilities. One of the things that I like to ask is, is we can, everybody here kind of knows what the devastation that can be caused from ransomware. Well, what if it was, we were ransoming a pacemaker? You know, then it's a yeah. real ransom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that is totally true. And, you know, you, you'd mentioned on these brain interfaces, like Neuralink and, and the other one uh, that you mentioned, but yeah, this is, uh, you know, every time I kind of see something about, about this movement, it freaks me out because, um, <laughs> you know, of the potential impact. I, I mean, it, 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 <laughs> it takes on a, a whole new me meaning when you, you know, like a, uh, we could do a takeover of that. If you could do a, a man mm -hmm. in the middle attack on someone with a brain interface, then well, <laughs> there's a lot you could do. But right, and, and the truth is, we are so addicted to this technology. You know, people are, are. You know, like I said, the name of my talk was, you know, resistance is futile. We're already Borg, and it's not because of the fact that we're going to be taken over by a race of cyborgs that are going to try and, you know, assimilate us. We're going to go willingly towards the technology because we're addicted and we're just waiting for our next fix. Yeah, totally, to uh, totally true. Hey, you know, like now let's let, talk about this. Maybe a good a good Z way. How did you find out about this? How did you get involved in the transhuman kind of movement? Um, you know, uh, uh, that what, what got you into it? What got you wanting to get your next fix? Um, to be honest, it, for me, it was more just a, a natural evolution of what I was already doing. Um, if you've never seen a picture of me, you can go ahead and Google me. I am covered in tattoos from my neck to my feet or from, um, I do flesh hook suspensions uh, as a hobby. I'm very into that modern primitive cyberpunk kind of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And, I've been aware of the grinder community for years, things like the firefly implants and, you know, the peg legs. But th my issue is always been, if I'm going to do something like this, it needs to be done in a safe way. You know, I have nothing but, you know, mad props and respect for, you know, the grinders that, you know, started the movement, but I'm just not that kind of guy. You know, we're talking about people that were taking just off the shelf, buy it at Radio Shack kind of components, mixing up some two part epoxy, covering the chip and then manually do it yourself, surgically implanting it. And, mm. you know, hats off to these guys, you know, for being those brave, you know, forerunners in this field. But I'm married and have five kids. <laughs> so for me, it was more a matter of when are we going to start seeing something that's commercially available that, you know, has some kind of a background and a company behind it that I can get something that has been tested for bioencapsulation to make sure that I'm not going to suffer any kind of heavy metal poisoning or anything from yeah. a breach of the encapsulation. So it's something that I've been watching for a very, very long time. Uh, are you familiar with the Firefly? No, I'm not. I'm not at all. You want to talk about crazy? That's one that I would recommend do some Googling on. Uh, the Firefly implant actually 
is an implant that most a lot of people got put in the tops of their hands and it actually uses radioactive material and it actually glows radioactive material okay all right we're we're, we're, we're gonna get to a hardcore area now (laughs) yeah to the you know and like i said you know i i want to be that that human cross between the human and the machine but i don't want to die from radiation poisoning and i don't want to die from heavy metal poisoning and you know that actually you know brings me to a very good point in especially if we're going to be discussing the transhuman movement like i said before i have nothing but respect for the the pioneers but, you know, we're not at that stage anymore. And I'm very cautious about people doing do-it-yourself kind of implants because, you know, I'll put it this way. One of my, the last implants I got was actually the wallet more chip, which is the credit card so I can do tap to pay. And if you get one of these implants and you talk to the wallet more company, you know, they don't call us, you know, testers or whatnot. They call us ambassadors. And the reason I bring this out is because ambassador sounds a hell of a lot nicer than guinea pig. You know, (laughs) everything I'm, anything in the transhuman world for the most part is not sanctioned by any type of medical authority. So be aware of this. Don't do this stuff yourself. Find yourself a reputable, you know, body modification parlor and somebody that knows how to implant these things safely. You know, there has been people who have actually died as a result of trying to do these type of modifications to themselves from sepsis and different infections. I'm all for moving the biohacker and the transhuman forward because I think it's going to become a part of our daily lives. But at the same time, I want people to understand that they should be doing this safely and responsibly. Yeah. Yeah. A good point. Because, you know, I, I was wondering about the dangers of this. I'm sure that, you know, now, you know, we've, we've, with the distributors that you mentioned before that, and you talked about the, um, the, the coating, I, I forget the technical term you use, but you know, the, the, the coating around the chips to make sure it's safe for the, but, but is there, is there risk now in, in, in doing, in, in doing this? Uh, is there, or. There's always risk. You know, anytime you're dealing with any type of surgery, whether it's medically necessitated or elective, anytime you're going into your body, there's a, the potential risk. Um, I think that it's a lot safer than it was in the beginning uh, of the movement because they're using actual medical grade bioencapsulation and it's not just a couple of, you know, two part epoxy or super, but you know, you can, and you can get serious medical complications from doing this. And that's why I said, go to a professional body modification parlor, because these are people that have done piercings and they understand the human physiology. Uh, for example, like if you're doing uh, an injectable style implant, you you want to go between the, the dermal skin and the muscle tissue. If you go too deep with one of these things and you actually get it into the muscle, it can cause infection. If you put it in the wrong place, they can migrate. Uh, I'm actually having an issue with some migration in one of my implants right now. I have a bioglass that I put in the top of my hand that you know originally was up by the, the knuckle right before the, the fingers begin, and it's now migrated about halfway down my hand. Right. You know, so these are things that can happen. I mean, I've heard stories of where somebody got an implant in their hand that wound up in their foot, you know. So <laughs> if you don't do these right, number one, it's not going to, you're not going to get the proper reads. It could, prov- it could wind up causing some other potential health issues down the road. So I'm all for, you know, people becoming part of the movement. I'm just saying do it the right way. So that way you can actually enjoy your implant. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it totally, I mean, it totally makes sense. And, and you guys are at the forefront, right? Not everything's, everything's figured out. But as you said, you, you're, you're not, you're not at the very beginning. You're not injecting radioactive material into your fingertips. No, <laughs> no. Like but, but going back to some of the security implications, you mentioned before that you are looking to get a full Linux system mm-hmm. put into your, into your, into your leg. I th- you know, a peg leg, I think you've referred to yes. it before. But I, I, I know a little bit that you're designing something yourself. Um, can you talk a little yes. bit about, about, about what you're doing in that area? Sure. Uh, the peg leg was actually a grassroots movement uh, based off of the Raspberry Pi Zero W. 
And the original version was meant to act as a logless file transfer. So if I wanted to give you access to some type of file and I didn't want any record of the fact that I gave it to you, uh, essentially what it does is it acts as like an intermediary drop spot. And what you would do is you would implant it in your leg, upper thigh, typically right behind your where your pants pocket would be. Uh, and the reason for that is there's no internal power. I, I've said that numerous times in terms of current commercial grade implants, there's no internal power. Mm. Uh, and that's why when it comes to the NFC and the RFID, those are very easy to use because they get their power from the receiver. Uh, in regards to the peg leg, what we do is we put an indirect power receiver, like, like a, a rapid charge uh, wireless charger receiver on it. And what you would do is you would take a battery pack that has the ability to do wireless charging and you would slip that into your pocket. It would energize the receiver coil and actually power up the Raspberry Pi in your leg. Um, I'm building my own PCB because the Raspberry Pi Zero and the Raspberry Pi Zero W2, one of the things that it doesn't have that I want is dual Wi-Fi to do, be able to do things like Wi-Fi pumpkins, deauth attacks, you know, Wi-Fi type stuff. Uh, so that's the difference between the one that I'm building and the current ver version of what would be considered the peg leg. Uh, if the website's still up there, you can go check it out. It's pegleg.org. That's, that's crazy. And we, you know, we're going back to some of these, uh, you know, original conversations that we had about, you know, with you stealing someone's, you know, ID card or something, there's no evidence, but now you can do a Wi-Fi attack you can walk mm -hmm. into a building, conduct a Wi-Fi attack. You don't need, uh, you know, you don't have to have a router or equipment in nope. your, you say, it's all adjustable in your body. In my body. That and the other thing that, the, the other thing that we can do when it comes to the peg leg is, you know, I'm sure you're, as you're well aware, there are certain businesses, governmental agencies where the idea of bringing technology inside is forbidden. You know, I, I've been to the Department of Justice when I was earlier on in my career here at CyberArk, and the first thing they do is they put you through a metal detector, they give you a locker, you know, no laptop, no foot, no cell phones, no nothing. You know, and these are the types of places where things like my peg leg, which I'm actually thinking about giving it a different name, maybe I'll call it a hack leg, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, these are the kind of instances where things like that would become very dangerous from an espionage type of situation. Uh, the other thing that that would actually do is like, like I said, I'm currently sitting here at the B-Sides conference in the new, in Newcastle, UK. So if I'm just at a conference or an airport or anywhere, there's a large gathering of, of individuals, I can slip that battery pack in my pocket. I could have conversations with people that are standing around me while all this at the same time, I'm doing low energy Bluetooth sweeps, auto pones with Metasploit, you know, basically unattended type scripted attacks could be going on just while we're sitting here. And, and all I have to do is wait until I go home later because I can connect all of these back to my C2 server that's actually sitting out in AWS. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of different areas. I mean, I mean, you've got a computer in your leg. You can do anything mm -hmm. that you could do exactly. with, you know, with a computer, with Wi-Fi connectivity. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the possibilities, and I think espionage is immediately where my brain kind of goes, something where, you know, you need to be extremely discreet, um, you need equipment, and you need to be able to get into to places. And I think that, you know, you, we can combine all of these things that we've been talking about today with these IDs, you know, grabbing someone's ID, cloning it, coming back, getting into the building, having a computer in there, conducting some mm -hmm. sweeping attacks. You know, when you put exactly. all these things together, it's not kind of like... Uh, it's not a drive-by situation. No, no, it's not. A, it's not a spray and pray. This you could be a essentially a one-man hacker collective, and walk into a building and with a little social engineering, you you know the possibilities are pretty endless. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm slightly terrified now, but let's <laughs> let, let's let's move. Let's think forward here. Um, you know, and get organizations thinking about this as a possible attack attack. You know, threat. What, what, mm -hmm. how, how, how can we kind of defend against some of these? Are there recommendations? Are there common things? That oh, you yeah. See that, that, yeah. It, it's things that we should have already been doing. You know, I mean, realistically, this is, this is my standard answer to this question. You know, we, when we talk about our data, 
you know, the concepts of multi-factor authentication in front of privilege and information is pretty, it's standard practice. You know, we all know about it. It's something we're familiar with, but we don't do the same thing for, for our physical security. I mean, realistically, how many times do you just have a badge reader, you scan your badge, it unlocks the door, you open the door and you walk through? Yeah. You know, there are, we, we need to do the same kind of multi-factor that we do for our privileged data, for our privileged access. You know, for example, I, I've worked, like I said, I've been doing IT now for th almost 30 years. You know, I remember, you know, early on in my career, when you went into your server room, it was like the, you know, those old door handles that had like the push buttons, you yeah, know, and, yeah. and you like, push, 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 and then you would turn this, you know, not much security to those, you know, but by the end of it, you know, I remember, you know, to get into the server room, first you had to badge, and then there was a keypad that you had to input a secondary code in, you know, so basically we multi-factored access into the, those secure locations. And the answer is very simple, defense in depth and a layered security approach. You know, there's not going to be any one silver bullet that's going to be able to stop somebody with augmentations or some type of integrated capability. What we can do is layer enough security, just like we do around data, that it, you're never going to be able to stop me from scraping that ID. What you can do is keep me from the secondary validation that only you know. So yeah. that would be the first answer. And as much as this is going to freak you out to tell you this, I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is going to be a situation where life imitates art or art imitates life, but you're familiar with uh, drug sniffing dogs, right? That they, yeah. You know, the drug canines? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a new kind of canine that's been offered as a resource for the police and the military, and they're actually technology sniffing dogs. Uh, I believe the component name, and I'm probably going to butcher this, is triphenylphosphate or something like that. Uh, and essentially, these are not used in the same fashion that you would use a drug dog, where they're used to make an arrest. They're going to discover something and you're arrested. These particular canines are actually used in the post-arrest investigation stage. Mm -hmm. uh, they're used predominantly with pedophilia, human trafficking, things where people are going to store data on hard drives. Mm -hmm. And after you've been arrested and the search warrants come out, they'll use these particular dogs to go through your house to try and find any type of data storage or hidden technology that you may have your, you know, backed up your, your information on. Uh, I actually found out uh, that where I live back in, in the U.S., I, I live in just outside of Austin, Texas, and I found out that the Dallas Police Department actually has acquired one of these canines. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So as funny as it was, I reached out to the Dallas Police Department, and after several emails back and forth explaining what a transhuman is and the fact that, yes, I'm for real and no, I'm not some kind of you know guy that's just messing with you, you know, I was able to provide them. And, and the funny thing is, is, I think I actually gave them your, uh, one of your, your original video that you did on my, uh, RSA talk as part of my CV that I sent them to validate. Me. Uh, they finally got the point that, yeah, this is something that's real. And they've really been very open with, you know, discussions. They've clued, they were the ones that told me the compound and they've actually invited me up to the Dallas police department where, I'm going to get introduced to Remy, the technology dog, and we're going to see if Remy has the, the ability to sniff out the implants in my hands and trigger. And if you think about back to the Terminator movies, you know, wherever the rebels were, they would always have dogs right out in front because the dogs could smell the machines. Right. So yeah. I'm really kind of looking forward. It's just been a matter of scheduling with all of my travel, but I am going to get up to Dallas and we're going to let Remy take a shot at me. And if she's able to detect those, you know, we may actually have a way to detect transhumans in the future. I don't know, but it's going to be a hell of a lot of fun figuring it out. Yeah, I, that is that is really really interesting when you're talking about that. Now I know because I, I know you get this question a lot. Um, you know, but is how do you get to airports? Does these oh, things God. come up? And <laughs> you know, does these things? <laughs> that is know, the go. number. That is one of the the top two questions that I get. Number one is how do you walk through airports, and the other one is, is typically, uh, are you real? 
I, I've actually had people ask me, are you a real person? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, but the, the answer to the question is how do I walk through airports? It's, it's very simple. I put one, the left foot in front of the right foot and then I repeat, you, so, know, you know, but the, these, you, these things can't, can't detect what's in your, no, so we don't no. have, you know, I mean, we have an x-ray, but that's a, you know, that's a, a very involved process to try and figure out quickly if someone's, if, if someone has these implants in them. So, well, if I may, for just a minute, uh, let's talk about the airport for just one second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Typically, we have two different types of security when it comes to air travel. You have a magnetometer, which is just the little thing that you'll walk through. And then we have the full body x-ray scans. Mm -hmm. So don't quote me on the amount, but I, I'm going to date myself. Before the TSA in the United States, I went in when Len was a very, very young guy, he actually worked for the airport as a security guard. Yeah, long, 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 long time ago. And the one thing that I learned from that job is those magnetometers are set to a specific minimum amount of metallic resistance. You know, I, I don't know what the correct measure in terms of force is. I don't know if it's a Newton or whatever it is, but I remember, you know, they're calibrated and they're calibrated in such a way that if you think about when you go through an airport, how many people wear like a necklace with a pendant on? You know, you don't mm. necessarily take those things off. Uh, they are set, and, and I believe back when I was doing that job, and this is more than 25 years ago, uh, I want to say it was, you had to have the total amount of metallic weight that was in like a 22 caliber bullet. So right. if you, anything below that, you would not energize. Now, if you think about when it comes to commercial grade implants, most of the implants are actually made out of silicone. You know, mm -hmm. the amount of actual metal that's contained within them is actually very minute. Even the Titan biomagnet, which is an actual magnet, it's an iron core wrapped in titanium, you know, and it's not even as big as a pea. So the total combined metal that's in all of my implants is still less than what would be on somebody's gold charm. Now, when I get the peg leg put in, that's going to be a different story, you know, but if we move over to the full body x-rays, same thing, you know, mm -hmm. the amount of x the strength of the x-rays that they use in airports is not meant like a medical grade x-ray where you're going to be able to see very fine bone structure and things like that. It's just meant to try and see through your clothes. Are you hiding something? And the truth is, again, they're not set that strong. I've actually never triggered anything on a full body x-ray. And I have gone international domestic. The, it just doesn't even come up. Yeah. And, and, you know, you can see it, even if it did, let's say with the peg leg, you know, like, I mean, the, the, you, you, no one's an expert, uh, they are of kind of medical, medical components that need to be inserted mm -hmm. into the body. A very, a very quick conversation. I have an implant here. It's medical. It's under my well, skin. You know. <laughs> to that, back to one of the points I made earlier, pretty much most, you know, countries have some type of law around personal medical information. In yeah. the United States, we have a law called HIPAA. So all they can ask me is medical. Yes, medical. That's all they're legally allowed to ask. Mm. If it's inside my body, it's basically off limits for them to try and get advanced details. And if they do, it opens them up to a lawsuit. So they won't. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, and this is, this is a way that you can, I mean, you, you have multiple layers of defense. For you, as someone that's conducting an attack, you know, using this technology, because you have the first thing that they have to make the leap that, okay, you have implants. And secondly, they have to deal with the laws that's going to prevent them from even kind of going into detail about it. So it's the exactly. the, the, the perfect way to, to conceal it. Now, I, I, I have a question here, and I think either answer is going to terrify me because you said at the start that the, you know, there's potentially up to 600,000 people with these with these implants, mm -hmm. the vast majority wouldn't be using them for malicious purposes, no. but it's still a lot of people. But do you Absolutely. know of any real life attacks that have happened? Um, you, you know, by that have initiated or been bio tra hacker transhuman incorporated? Yeah. Actual attacks? No. But on the opposite side of that coin, you know, so this is going to be kind of like a two part answer. And I, I'm, betting that you'll probably be terrified of the answer I'm going to give you anyway. Um, <laughs> do I know? 
I, I here's the thing. There has never been anything as far as any type of white paper or remediation DFIR that has actually come out and said that, you know, human augmentation or implants were a root cause of a breach. But I do know quite a few people on different red teams within the U.S. that do use them as standard parts of red team engagements. So that being said, if they're being used at by red teams, the idea that they actually happened out in the wild to me is probably safe to say. The only difference is it either when the breach was discovered, the initial entry path via an augmentation was either not discovered. Again, you would have to make that leap or yeah. it was looked at for the larger aspect of the breach. And this was just overlooked. Yeah, and, and well, I mean, you could you could come up with a lot of information about a breach that's happened without making that jump. For instance, if it was a Wi-Fi based attack, you could say that the attack happened originated from this place. Based on that, we think it's even this person. How mm -hmm. they brought the equipment in, we don't know. You know, so there's and yeah, and you have to exactly. make that jump. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to be honest, if I had to try and guess. I think that it would probably, and this is just wild, wicked speculation on my part, but as being somebody that's in this kind of world and seeing what works and what doesn't, my guess that it would probably have been an initial foothold on either a mobile device that was then used for to lateral into a corporate environment, or it was some type of IoT, just mm -hmm. because of the fact that we're dealing with a lot of it, the NFC communication protocol within those two different areas. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I would, I would agree, agree with that too. And, and as I said, I think both answers will terrify me because if you could point me to one, then okay, it's terrifying. But if you can't, based on what we know, that's even more so. Yeah, I like, guess. <laughs> yeah. Was, well, crap. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's incredibly interesting. I, we're coming towards the end of it. I, I have some, some questions now, just kind of about the, the general, kind of general transhuman movement of these implants. You know, sure. At the moment, it's on the fringe. Do you think that this is going to become mainstream? Do you think this is something that absolutely, absolutely, one hundred percent? And and I mean, and, uh, go, 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 go for it. I was just going. I was just going to ask. You know, what, why? Why is that? Is it? You know, what? What are the? What are some of the core cool benefits that everyday people could get from you know having having oh. these implants? <laughs> I think yeah, I opened a can. Do we need another hour? You now? just. You just. <laughs> I, I thought the whole point was not to open Pandora's box, but <laughs> you just swung the the door wide. Um, let. How can the standard everyday person get something out of this? I mean, for starters. Uh, if you drive a Tesla, you know, you could potentially put an implant in that would give you your Tesla key. Right. Then you know, lose your keys. Yeah. You can just get into your car and drive. Yeah. Um, if you are one of those people that's very forgetful, you know, you could put your work badge on an implant and, you know, oh, I forgot my keys, but I can still get in. Mm -hmm. You know, personally, I have a uh, RFID door, door reader on my office. So one of my implants is actually the key to get into my office. It keeps my wife and my kids out of my office, you know? <laughs> um, but in terms of, do I see this continuing? Oh my God. Uh, like I said earlier, we've got, you know, spinal stimulation tools now that are, mm. are returning motility to paralyzed people. Uh, you know, the speech I gave here today, you know, like I said, resistance is futile. Some of the, the things that I brought out in the, the talk today is the fact that we have so many, we, I, I feel we are right on the cusp of some major, major breakthroughs around quantum computing, around the transhuman movement. You know, there, there is, uh, I think it was Cortical Labs back in 2021 actually grew neurons in a bowl that have been incorporated into the, one of the fir first hybrid microprocessors. And the speed at which the, this thing runs is exponentially faster than traditional CPUs. And the fact that it works over the same principles as, you know, the brain's internal technology, because neurons, as well as so the semiconductors, both run off electricity. You know, we're looking at things the, like DNA being utilized as a storage platform. You know, one gram of DNA fluid can actually hold over seven petabytes of data with a retention life lifespan of over a hundred years if it's kept in the correct climate. 
you know, so, I mean, if you think about it, what I could potentially walk out of your data center with the center with your entire contents of your, your data center in the bottom of a fast food cup. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and if by, if we look at just the way that we interact with technology now, I'm not a big video game, but you know, I have a lot of friends who are, so have you looked at the PS5? No, I, know, if you're I, a gamer? I, I haven't, I haven't, but, um, yeah, my, my girlfriend's, uh, uh, you know, very into the gaming. So we're looking at tr maybe getting one now. That looks incredible. The graphics on that look. Well, it's not even cool. about the graphics. That's, that's not even where I was going. Um, a friend of mine has a PS5 and he, I, I don't know if it was Call of Duty or it was one of those, you know, shooting, shoot em up games. The fact that we have integrated into the haptics of the controllers, pressure pulls for triggers, you know, vibrational stimulation. Uh, we're trying to add you know, you can add Philips Hue or, or smart lighting to, to enhance, you know, the effects mm -hmm. of your video games. We are trying to develop the ability, virtual reality. Um, oh God, you know, the entire VR world. And I don't want to use the one word that everybody knows because I'm just not, don't want to give them the publicity, you know, starts with an M and ends with an A. <laughs> But, you know, we're, we're trying to get that sixth sense, you know, I mean, and, and to me, I wonder if that's kind of what the transhuman movement might start being referred to as, you know, we have, everybody has five senses. So if I can intercept that information from a computer, if I'm playing a video game and I can somehow through some type of brain implant or, or you know, I can actually feel some simulation, hopefully not pain, you know, if I'm playing a shoot 'em up game, yeah. you know, if I can, you know, we're looking at the ability for, you know, ocular replacements, 3d printed organs, you know, mm. we're not going to stop, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you ask if I see, think this is going to get any more integrated as time goes on. I don't see how it couldn't. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, Imagine if, you know, one day, you know, and, and just remember, everything is science fiction until it isn't. And at one point, a honestly, a lobotomy was considered medical breakthrough science. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, if we just look at, you know, the way that we inter interface to the world, we all want to make our, our daily lives easier. You know, so if I can just have some type of an implant that could handle a lot of the, the tedious, repetitious day-to-day -day work, you know, I think the human animal as a whole is going to go for ease of use over complication most times. The only problem is, is I don't think they're going to realize by doing this, the amount of complication that they'll be adding. Yeah. No, I completely agree with everything you said. I, you know, I, 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 I didn't believe that this would probably, you know, that that would would end up in there at the start of this conversation. But you've turned me into a believer, uh, <laughs> you know, Len. <laughs> and I agree with you. I don't see how, you know, we can't keep progressing forward um, in in so many areas. So, but I look. I want to thank you for 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 sharing your time coming on the podcast. It's been interesting. It's been also very terrifying, um, <laughs> as it is every time I listen to you speak. Every time I listen to you, I appreciate or, it. <laughs> but you know, really informative. Um, so I just want to to say for the audience, if they want to follow you, if they want to check out some of the talks, what's the best way that they can engage with you and connect with you uh, on social platforms uh, and other areas? Uh, the two that I use honestly the most would be either LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is at hacker underscore two one three, and you can find me on LinkedIn at Len No L E N last name N O. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Len. Uh, I, I've learned a lot and I uh, look forward to chatting you, hopefully in person one time uh, at a conference. Hey, let's do it, man. I, I really would love to meet up with you in the real world. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you again for, for asking me on. I really appreciate the opportunity. This is the place that uh, made nerd cool. The most popular password in the United States is password one, two, three. Those are some of my previous passwords. Who on earth would actually fall for that? Sensitive information has been sort of given to the wrong hands.